The Tom Woods Show, episode 814. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. To all my young listeners, you want to stand out from your peers? Then don't do what they do. Join Praxis, get real on-the-job experience, and a real job. Be entrepreneurial. Get all the details at TomWoods.com slash Praxis. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here, talking today to documentary filmmaker Cassie J., whom you can visit at Cassie dot com, and her film The Red Pill, which is about the men's rights movement, which she began investigating as what seemed to be an interesting topic for a documentary. But she began it with a distinctly unsympathetic point of view. But by the end of her project, she had come to rethink her assumptions about this and about the position that men hold, for example, in the typical dispute in family court and in a variety of other areas of society. It turns out that the story is not quite as clear as she and many other people no doubt once thought. So the film is The Red Pill. You can find out about it at theredpillmovie.com. And I'm glad to welcome her now. Cassie, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. I watched uh, The Red Pill. Very, very interesting. At, by this point, you're probably tired of telling your story um, of how it is that you went from holding one view to being willing to entertain another view. But at the same time, to me, that's the heart of the whole thing because it's so rare for somebody to say, you know, people I thought were 180 degrees away from me actually have a point of view after all. So I wonder if you can, before we even get into the details, just comment on that aspect of this. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you say that's so rare, and a lot of people do say that's rare, and I think that's kind of sad that uh, not more people are willing to challenge their own strong-held beliefs and uh, go to explore the opposing viewpoint to see if they have a point. And, you know, that is what I did with the red pill, although I, I didn't go into making the red pill thinking that was what was going to happen. I, I never imagined that my feminist views would be challenged by uh, going to talk to a bunch of men's rights activists. Uh, but sure enough, they were. And, and the whole film took three and a half years to make. So it was a very long journey of, of me really uh, sitting with the, the, these opposing views and, and really letting them soak in and doing the research to see if they uh, were accurate in what men's rights activists were saying about men's issues. And uh, so it was a very long process. It didn't happen overnight, but the film does uh, show a, a bit of that journey. I bet there are a lot of people listening who don't even know what the men's rights movement is. If you had to summarize it, what would you say it's all about? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, uh, okay, so the mainstream uh, media version of the men's rights movement is that they're this hate group, they're misogynists, they want to turn back the clock on women's rights. And through my years of making the Red Pill movie, I found out that that was uh, quite a different story once you start talking to men's rights activists. Uh, so really what men's rights activists are about is trying to shine light on the ways that men as a gender are being systematically discriminated against in societies worldwide. And some of the issues that uh, they talk about a lot are definitely father's rights, and there's so many issues under that umbrella um, with uh, child custody and, and uh, joint custody opposition from feminist organizations that, that are fighting joint custody custody legislation. Uh, there's also paternity fraud, which is a man raising child that he later finds out isn't his. Uh, there's alimony. There's uh, the uh, false accusations where uh, people in divorce court, uh, women are uh, kind of have a, um, I guess, more of a free pass to, to make allegations against men and be believed. Uh, whereas, you know, it's not often that you'll find a man being able to say, my wife is abusing me, and then therefore he gets uh, custody of the children. So it really is kind of this disproportionate privilege that women have to make these false allegations in order to get uh, custody of their kids or child support. Uh, and then so beyond father's rights, there's also uh, domestic violence issues where if the police are called to a domestic violence situation, the assumption is that the man was the primary aggressor. So he's the one handcuffed and taken to jail, even if he has a stab wound and she has a, a bruise. And uh, beyond domestic violence, we have uh, boys in school, uh, in grade school with uh, this kind of feminized way of, of teaching and learning where you should sit still in your seat and be quiet, uh, which girls are a lot easier to um, 
learn that way and be in school that way, whereas boys really need to run around and, uh, you know, touch things, be involved. And then once they go to college, uh, boys have a lower enrollment rate. They're also earning less college degrees. Uh, false accusations on college campuses is an issue. And uh, gosh, there's so many issues, uh, men's health issues, uh, male disposability, which is uh, that majority of war deaths are men, majority of workplace deaths and dangerous jobs are men. Uh, so yeah, I, I could go on and on, but there's a lot of men's issues. So the men's rights movement is really just trying to shine light on all these various issues. But at the same time, you come out of feminism, you, you come out of, uh, you know, at least get influenced by the women's rights movement. And I'm sure you wouldn't say that because you find merit in the men's rights case that there's suddenly no merit to the women's rights movement. So if there are complaints that men have and complaints that women have, what the heck's going on here? You cannot, you know, that's, that pretty much exhausts it. So what's hap How can that be? <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I definitely haven't, uh, you know, lost compassion for women's issues after making the Red Pill movie. I, I've, all my previous work was really about women's issues and sexuality, LGBT issues. Uh, my previous films were largely about women's issues and LGBT issues. So, you know, I have a, a lot of uh, compassion and, and interest in those topics and exploring those issues. Uh, but with the men's rights movement, uh, they really are just trying to shine a light on something that's rarely discussed. And when it is uh, tried to be discussed in, in uh, on college campuses, uh, in organizing groups, men's rights groups to talk about these issues, they are shut down with protests or pulling fire alarms. And uh, that's you know what I saw while I was making the film, and also with the release of my film, The Red Pill. We've we've had a lot of. Um, experiences with censorship and uh, pulling and banning of screenings, uh, even a petition to ban me from the entire country of Australia. Uh, so uh, there's definitely uh, this kind of cultural dialogue that doesn't, uh, when we're talking about gender issues, we really mostly, uh, most people just want to talk about women's rights issues in the gender equality discussion. But if men's rights or men's issues are ever brought up, um, it's called hate speech and it's, there's efforts to shut it down. Let me ask you this. This is somewhat rhetorical, but when you were doing your work on the LGBT documentary, was anybody trying to bar you from entire countries or <laughs> was anybody shouting down uh, um, op opposing views, any conservatives shouting down opposing views when, as far as you could see? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Now, looking back, no, we we didn't have, uh, you know, I wasn't banned from country in the films, wasn't pulled from screenings because it was about uh, LGBT issues. Uh, the, the worst that we had with, with my last film, The Right to Love, which was chronicling a family's fight for gay marriage rights, uh, the worst we had was, you know, the Westboro Baptist sending some threatening emails, but, you know, it's kind of to be expected. Oh, yeah. No, the, that they don't even count. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they were threatening to protest a uh, an Ian Anderson concert I went to. Now, Ian Anderson's a flute player who's been around for 40 years. And then what they were protesting was that he had gotten a divorce back in like 1973. And then he's only been married to his current wife for 27 years. And so they were protesting his divorce from about 40 years ago. And I thought, all right, look, you know, nobody's perfect and everything, but for goodness sake, that's <laughs> what you, of, of all the things in the world, you're going to be upset about. And they, they didn't even bother to show up as it turns out. They were not there. But I actually, that was the show that I got to meet him afterward. And they were all wondering, you know, we've toured the world as musicians. We have never <laughs> encountered a group like this. Who on earth are these people? So, so, all right. I just wanted to raise that because I do think there's an asymmetry, let's say, in the way different groups greet controversy and opposing views. They might not agree with you, but at least they let you talk. And that's not always the case of the, the, the other way. Now, when in your movie, you do you do have both sides have their say, and you have some feminist voices in there. And one of the points that one of the people in the film makes is that when you're talking about men and their rights as parents or their right to decide about the, the disposition of a child, the very life of a child, the argument that they made was men have, can exercise their rights before they have intercourse, but once impregnation has taken place, one person in your film said it's entirely – the woman's choice from that moment on, the men have no input whatsoever. And the argument for that was, after all, it's the woman who bears the burden of childbirth and bears the burden of nine months of pregnancy and the health risks involved. So she really should be the one making all the decisions from that moment on. What would you now, Cassie J, post-Red Pill movie, 
say to that? Is, is there not an at least a superficial plausibility to that argument? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I, I would like to share an email I got today because I think it speaks to uh, this topic. I, I got an email from a gentleman saying, thank you for making this film. And he said, I was raised that you never uh, hit a woman or, uh, you know, do anything physically violent to a woman. And you also never get a divorce. And he entered a, a marriage when he was very young to a woman who was violent. And he's in the military and uh, she became pregnant. And right after a couple months after she was pregnant, they found out she was pregnant. He found out he was going to be deployed. And she started uh, throwing herself uh, on the ground, pounding her abdomen. Uh, obviously, it sounds like this woman has some kind of, you know, mental uh, disorder issue. Uh, but he, you know, was trying to refrain her from, uh, you know, causing this miscarriage. And luckily, the, the, his daughter was born, and now uh, he went through a horrible divorce and custody battle, and um, they got joint custody, even though there was all this proof of her um, uh, stabbing him with uh, broken glass faces and um, cutting up his face where he has to wear a beard all the time to cover the scars. I mean, just horrible story. Uh, but, you know, he still has to send off his six-year-old daughter half of the time to the mother's house with her, um, with his daughter's stepfather. And so the, the wife's or ex-wife's new family. And, uh, and even though they have joint custody, he's still having to pay child support and, and be the, you know, financial, um, breadwinner and caretaker of the family. Uh, but anyways, I, I say that because I, the story about her, her being pregnant. And then when he found out he was going to be deployed, she started trying to induce this, you know, miscarriage or abortion of sorts. And how could you not call that a men's issue when here's a, a father who's for the first time learning that he's going to be a father and wants to protect this child, even though the child, the, the fetus in, is in the woman's body and say it's her body, her choice. But could a man just, you know, helplessly sit there watching as his wife is trying to, you know, kill their baby? Uh, so I, I think that, you know, it, obviously a lot of these issues are very sticky and people have a lot of, uh, you know, opinions that come from, you know, their ideology or morality or religion and all that. But, uh, but you know, I, I think that's just a really heart-wrenching story that uh, in the film, in The Red Pill, there there is a, a leader in, in the feminist movement who says that once a woman is impregnated, it's her choices uh, from then on uh, what happens with the fetus or the child. And uh, he has no say. That's where his reproductive rights end. Uh, so it is an interesting discussion. What about the argument that part of the reason that um, men don't get equal time with children following a divorce is that this is a reflection of the fact that before the divorce, a lot of men are not exactly 50-50 parents. And then after the divorce, suddenly they want everything divided right down the middle. It doesn't work that way. That was the kind of argument I heard in the film. Do, do you – and I know, I know the film is not about your personal opinions, but – in my conversation with you, I am curious about your personal opinions. What did, what do you think when you hear that kind of argument? Oh, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I really struggled including that uh, soundbite in the film. It was from a, a male feminist scholar. He, he's a gender studies professor at USC. And he said that uh, when men's rights activists want equal custody uh, after marriage, uh, why should they be entitled to that when they weren't an equal parent during the marriage, meaning that they weren't helping uh, raise the child full time or, or being at home half of the time uh, and, you know, being more involved in that kind of way. And I, I struggled including that comment in the film because I, I do have very strong opinions about that comment now after making this film, which is even though, you know, uh, historically speaking, the, the genders have evolved into these roles largely because of biological differences with women being, you know, the one to give birth and also breastfeed. So it made more sense for her to be at home with the child. And there's been studies that show, uh, you know, skin to skin to contact between mother and baby is important for, you know, the first uh, few months of the baby's life. And so, I mean, there's all these reasons that, uh, you know, science says that women should be, uh, you know, attached to the child right after they're born. And so it, it did make more sense to have the, the man go out and be the, uh, you know, breadwinner and, and uh, producing in society at large. Uh, so so when this uh, feminist scholar says that men weren't, uh, these fathers weren't uh, actively involved as parents because they weren't home half of the time to, to help raise the child, 
uh, it's saying that the breadwinner role isn't an important role to have for a child, which I'm sure, you know, many parents listening uh, obviously know that you do need to make a living and be able to pay the mortgage and be able to buy the groceries and pay the gas money or, or pay for the diapers. And I've met a lot of uh, kind of reverse gender role couples uh, throughout the years. So the woman is the breadwinner and the man is the stay-at-home dad. And, uh, you know, they also acknowledge that the woman being the breadwinner is such an important role. They need a breadwinner. And I even saw this with gay couples when I was uh, making, you know, films about LGBT issues that oftentimes gay married couples did have designated gender roles. There was one that was more kind of the stay-at-home parent and the other was the breadwinner. So, uh, so yeah, that's my thought on the uh, comment about, you know, fathers not being actively involved if they're the breadwinner, but, you know, children cost a lot of money. <laughs> what about the argument that's been made against you that the cases that you're talking about are, you know, maybe they're outlier sort of cases, or this is largely driven by anecdote rather than hard data, and that the hard data shows that eh, overall men are more or less given a fair shake. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, when we're talking about gender issues, it is easy to slip into the kind of anecdotal, you know, well, I know a person that does X, Y, Z, like when I was talking about, you know, the reverse gender roles couple. Uh, so, you know, it's easy to slip into that. And I, I think those conversations are important, too. They, they humanize a lot of these issues. Uh, but absolutely, I believe that, you know, studies and research and facts that that aren't uh, advocacy, advocacy based studies where, you know, so many of uh, even women's rights issues that have uh, stats that are thrown around, a lot of them are studies that were funded by feminist organizations. Uh, so we have to, you know, have that in mind when we're looking at these statistics, who funded it, what organization was behind it. And so it, it does get uh, very muddy when you start looking into that. So with my film, I, I tried to always use statistics that were from organizations that most people would agree are more uh, or should be more balanced in their reporting and, and how they, you know, conduct their surveys. So I use uh, statistics from like the CDC uh, and, you know, Harvard research papers, that kind of thing. But, um, but I mean, you know, gender, everyone's entitled to uh, an opinion about it because we all have a gender. We all have experiences with our gender if we want choose to look at it or not or express our experiences or not. We all have those experiences. Um, and, you know, with my film, I'm just trying to elevate the conversation and, and look at what, you know, when we talk about gender equality in this um, battle of the sexes, uh, you know, gender equality, that term is usually applied to the idea of women's rights, progressing women's rights. Uh, and, you know, I became a feminist uh, when I was in my late teens. And the reason I became a feminist was because I thought it was the movement for gender equality. And then when I started making the red pill, I realized that I didn't know any of these men's issues. And I thought, well, how could feminism be the movement for gender equality if I couldn't if I couldn't, and other feminists that I was interviewing, even, you know, these very prominent uh, leaders of the feminist movement, couldn't name any men's rights issues and would flat out say men have no issues. They're the privileged gender. Uh, they're not being discriminated against in any way. But we we know that they are in family court and with domestic violence. Uh, you know, in my film, we talk about domestic violence shelters and how uh, rates of domestic violence is almost equal, 43% of of all intimate partner violence are male victims. Uh, so that's almost equal, very close. Uh, but there are 2,000 women's shelters in the U.S. for domestic violence victims that are female and a single domestic violence shelter for male victims. And it was just started this past year in 2016. Uh, so, you know, I'm really just starting uh, or trying to look at the gray area that's not really addressed in the gender equality discussion. And I, you know, hope that's what the film does. All right. I got more questions for you. Let's first thank our sponsor. Hey everybody. If you are or know a young person who might be interested in pursuing a path other than the traditional one of four years in college and then sitting there waiting by the phone, then check out Praxis where you can get an excellent apprenticeship opportunity followed by a guaranteed job offer. I recently had a chance to talk to Praxis participant Mitchell Earl. Mitchell, tell me what your Praxis experience was like. 
Well, Tom, uh, for me, it was really valuable. It gave me three things more than anything. It gave me exposure, experience, self-awareness. I, I didn't get that when I went to college and when I started working um, afterwards. And for me, it really just turned everything around after that. Well, how has it changed your life? What are you doing now and how did that come out of Praxis? Yeah, good question. So I was about to start my law degree and MBA program and instead kind of put all of that on halt to do Praxis instead. Um, I moved all the way across the country to join a tech and accounting startup. Um, worked with my business partner through the duration of my apprenticeship and ultimately um, ended up you know, moving into a couple different roles after I ended Praxis. That's where I am today. I work as chief of staff, report directly to the CEO, and I, I couldn't design a better job than what I have now. Get all the details plus some free goodies at TomWoods.com slash Praxis. All right, let me ask you something related to some of the reaction to the film. I mean, I guess it, it got the kind of reaction you almost certainly expected it would get, that in men's rights circles, they're glad to see somebody they wouldn't have expected giving them a respectful hearing. In feminist or, frankly, just mainstream circles, hostility, open hostility. But in particular, though, one of the arguments that's been made is that maybe there was a sanitizing – and I want to give you an opportunity to answer this, a sanitizing of some of the voices in the men's rights movement, who sometimes, if, if you believe the quotations that we read in these left-wing, uh, on these left-wing websites, they, they say some quite blood-curdling things about women. And I'm the father of five girls. I wouldn't want my girls spoken to or about that way. Uh, like, I don't want to mention names, but I think you know people in the men's rights movement who just have just say horrible things about about women. There is, and I understand people might be angry because they were treated unjustly, but you can't blame all women for your injustice. How do you answer that argument that uh, these people should have been called to account for their terrible language? Uh, well, definitely in, in the film, I do point out some of these shocking headlines that men's rights activist websites have, uh, and many of them are clickbait kind of headlines uh, to get people to, to think, what, what's that about? Look at the article. And then when you read within the article, you do find out that it's satire. Uh, you know, of course, these kind of tactics, uh, I would never do. That's not my personality style. Uh, but oddly enough, the irony of it is that those kind of headlines are what got me to jump down this rabbit hole of making the Red Pill movie. I, I was, I thought these were the misogynists that I've been hearing about from feminist circles, that, that they're trying to turn back the clock on women's rights. And and that's what got me making this film about the men's rights movement. Uh, so, and keep in mind that, you know, it, there are some men's rights organizations that uh, utilize the, this kind of clickbait tactics more than others. And A Voice for Men is definitely one. And that was the website, avoiceformen.com, that originally uh, led me into uh, looking more into the men's rights movement. Uh, and they have only been around for, um, I think, about five years by now. Uh, and uh, but the men's rights movement at large really started around the 70s with the men's liberation movement, which uh, started in in the San Francisco Bay Area where I live. Uh, and Dr. Warren Farrell, uh, who wrote The Myth of Male Power, which is kind of viewed as the book that inspired a lot of men's rights activists to become men's rights activists. Uh, he was a part of the men's liberation movement in the 70s, and he's been speaking for decades about men's issues. And, uh, you know, really getting drowned out by the, the feminist perspective on gender. And uh, so when A Voice for Men came around with uh, these shocking headliners and, and, you know, these shock and appall tactics to get clicks, uh, that's when the men's rights movement really started to get written about. But unfortunately, with, you know, uh, mainstream media, you know, painting them all as misogynists. And so it, obviously it's a double-edged short sword where they... They took this, uh, you know, shock tactic to get attention, but now they have negative attention. And a lot of men's rights activists don't agree with uh, that shock and appall approach. Uh, but, you know, oddly enough, it did lead into, you know, me making this film and, and the more reasonable men's rights activists who, uh, who just want to talk about the issues are now able to because more people are hearing about the men's rights movement. Uh, but one thing I would like to say is that across the board, all the men's rights activists I met None of them want to turn back the clock on women's rights. And many of them became a men's rights activist because they were originally a feminist, caring about women's issues and women's equality. And then when they started to learn about men's issues, uh, they wanted to bring that into the gender equality discussion. And they were 
you know, basically kicked out of, of the group, you know, shunned from the feminist movement because they wanted to talk about men. And so that's how the men's rights movement really started to, you know, gain members, uh, if you could call it that. I mean, it's not like this organized group that you get a membership card or anything, but uh, that's how they started to care about men's issues was because they weren't allowed to talk about it within feminism. Um, so within my film, I, I really wanted to explore the differences of the platforms between the men's rights perspective and the feminist perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I guess you could do this with like Democrats and Republicans. So you could either make a film exploring their different platforms on the issues, or you can make a film exploring their different tactics in comments that are made online or, you know, this kind of mudslinging that happens on Twitter. Uh, I didn't want to make that kind of film. Someone else can if they want to. I wanted to make a film that was really exploring the differences between the platforms. And, and that's what my film became. I do want to ask you one more thing that's only indirectly related to the film. Again, I I know when I've come out with books that have been controversial, I've relished the opportunity to be able to respond to critics. And one thing critics have tried to say to you is you've appeared, they say, on some controversial podcasts, and how dare you do that? You've been on controversial shows promoting your film, and this is reprehensible. My personal view is that within reason, anybody who wants to give me an opportunity to speak to their audience – I'll do it. Why wouldn't I, right? It's an opportunity to speak to a lot of people. And if those people are wrong, all the more reason for me to go talk to them. Is that, has that been your answer? <laughs> yeah, I, I have yet to turn down an interview. Uh, I'll talk to anyone who wants to talk to me. And, I, you know, that has gotten me in trouble, <laughs> apparently, because early on when I started releasing the film in October 2016, I agreed to be on a podcast from, I, I guess it was like a pickup artist site that, a lot of feminist groups claim that they're white supremacists. And I mean, I didn't do some massive like background check before I, I go on a podcast. But when I did that podcast with, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. But when I did that podcast interview with them, it was just all about my film and, and what I've learned by making this film. So I, I don't I don't see what's wrong with that. Uh, but, you know, obviously, I, I'm sure opponents to, to me in the film, they're going to find any way to uh, discredit me or, or try to smear my reputation. And that's, I guess, to be expected. But, you know, once I start picking and choosing who I'm going to do interviews with, I, I think that's even a slippery, a more slippery slope than just doing every interview you're invited to do. Because then who do you choose to talk to and not talk to? And, and what's the, uh, you know, agenda behind that? Uh, but I don't know. Well, we can. T the very fact you're on this show shows you're not very selective about the, <laughs> the, the shows you appear on. What do you What do you want people to do? What is the call to action at the end of this film? You don't want them to just walk away and say, "Huh, that was interesting," and then forget all about it. What should they do? <laughs> well, you know, I there's not really a call to action at the end of the film because I don't tell people what to think. I, I do briefly say where I ended up after making this film, but in no way, shape, or form am I telling the audience to do the same. Uh, and I think when people see the film for themselves, they'll absolutely see that, you know, it's not a call to action film, but it is a, a film that lets multiple perspectives uh, share their, their view within the film. And a lot of it uh, contradicts each other. And there's obvious divides between uh, the movements. And, uh, and it does inspire discussion. I, I don't think it's the type of film that, you know, someone could, it's a two hour long film. I don't think anyone can watch it and say, all right, on to the next thing, let's talk about the weather. Uh, it really does inspire discussions and debates. And I've seen that with uh, people attending our screenings and then going and doing their own YouTube videos or podcasts talking about their experience. And uh, there's actually one great podcast uh, of a oh, boyfriend and girlfriend after seeing the film in New York where uh, they did, a, I guess, like an hour-long podcast talking about their experience seeing the film. And they obviously had very different experiences. Uh, the podcast is called Dirty, Sexy Monogamy, and you can find their link on theredpillmovie.com. Uh, but it, it was really interesting because she, she was obviously offended and triggered by a lot of the things in the film. And he was actually thinking, well, I thought it was a pretty reasonable argument. And so they end up having a debate live on this podcast. It's really interesting. So anyways, the, the goal of the film is to encourage discussions. And, uh, you know, mind you, right before I started making the red pill, the biggest argument I ever had with my boyfriend, who, who now I've been with for almost six years, uh, the biggest argument I ever had with him uh, it happened right before I started making the red pill, and I was uh, very easily uh, triggered. 
uh, by uh, we were having a disagreement over the idea of rape culture. And uh, and he was, you know, in hindsight, posing these very rational uh, arguments. But I was unwilling to listen to what he was saying or, or trying to understand where he was coming from. And I was immediately writing him off as that that it was misogynistic kind of uh, talking points and which is crazy to think in hindsight because he's he he was actually uh, raised uh, in Berkeley as a feminist and uh, his family are all feminists and uh, so there there was no reason for me to believe that he was you know some closeted misogynist but just his uh, the opposing views that he was bringing up in this discussion about rape culture I I was I just completely turned off and immediately started otherizing him thinking you you are a part of this you know the the shadow side of men in the world and and I it was it was very strange and I, I think there are a lot of people especially feminists like how I I was when I started making this film that uh, are easily uh, triggered and upset without really trying to understand the opposing view and it took me a very long time to understand the men's rights perspective um, to get past that point of being easily angered and uh, wanting to you know shut down and, and just start you know screaming and arguing with uh, these different points of view I was hearing uh, but once we could get past that that point of uh, just utter disgust and rage about hearing a different perspective and and get beyond that point to the to the point of trying to understand the opposing point of view or the alternate perspective, I think that's where, you know, the magic happens. That's where gender equality can thrive. And that's where we can all look at each other. I mean, this sounds very poo -poo in the moment to be saying this, but that's where we can all really start to treat each other like people and like family and have compassion for each other's experiences. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, where we need to arrive. What's next for you now? Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be traveling with the film and screening all over the world. And uh, we're, we just signed on with a distributor who's going to be taking the red pill to uh, online platforms and video on demand platforms like Netflix and Hulu and iTunes and Amazon, all of that. Uh, so the projected release date for the worldwide release online is March 2017. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. And uh and then eventually I would love to make another film. I, I know I've kind of branded myself like with a scarlet letter after making this film where I, I don't know if I'll uh, be able to, you know, continue making documentaries in the same way where I used to uh, be because now I have this stigma that I, I'm attached to this film about men's issues that, you know, gives them a, a, a fair shake. Um, but, you know, I, I would like to keep exploring these different controversial topics and, and see where that goes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds great. And, and by the way, that's not a bad thing to have people think about you, that you give people a fair shake. Mm -hmm. You know, this, I mean, because as you said at the beginning, isn't it a shame how rare that is that when we feel like there are people who are very far from us philosophically, it's very rare that we sit down with them and try to hash it out and, and not worry about who's scoring points and who's winning, but rather just try to have a meeting of the minds and see if we can sort out the source of our differences. That never happens. <laughs> That's the only thing that never happens. That's the one thing you can guarantee won't happen. And yet I think you went out of your way to try to make that happen in this film. So the website is theredpillmovie.com. Correct. All right, so theredpillmovie.com is where you should go to, to check it out. We're going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 814 for episode 814. And I'll wish you the best. I won't. I was wondering if you had thought about specifically what your next topic would be, but it sounds to me like your whole heart is still in your current project. Yes, I, I haven't picked a, a new topic yet, but um, definitely want to figure that out within a year or so. <laughs> well, maybe on some of these uh, flights around the world, you'll have a little time to, to sit and think. Well, thanks so much for your time today. I, I really hope people check out theredpillmovie.com. Very, very worthwhile viewing. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. All right. Before I let you go for today, I want to fill you in on something my 13-year-old and I are going to be working on. Now, obviously, she's a few years off from driving a car, but her mother is of the belief that she should earn her own money to buy the car because we want to teach her certain things and we want to make her a responsible, hardworking person. And I'm totally on board with that. But I said to her, well, you can either earn seven twenty five an hour flipping burgers to get that car or you can do something a little bit more lucrative that will 
build up a portfolio for you, not have all that time totally wasted. I mean, what are you going to do with burger flipping talents later in life, right? That's not going to do any good for you. What about starting your own little business, doing something that people need? Because what I want to teach her is that is not to be an entitled, snooty, annoying millennial or whatever, I don't know what generation she's in, being 13 years old. I want to teach her that what capitalism is about is providing value to other people, is doing things that your fellow man needs, figuring out what that person needs, and then providing it. So, all right, so what is it? Well, here's the deal, and this is something everybody knows. This is a totally open secret. I don't understand why more people don't do it. You look around at local businesses in your area, most of them have no website, or they have a terrible, embarrassing, horrible website. There's no contact info on it. It looks like your seven-year-old designed it. It's awful. And they do need a website because they're going to become invisible. No one's going to see them. If they're a younger person and they have no website, they're not even going to see these, these companies. So, for example, I was having my car detailed last month. So what did I do? I went online and I looked for a website so I could get prices. I don't want – look, it's not 1977 anymore. I don't want to pick up the phone and call. I just don't. I don't want to call. So I went online, and most of them have no website. So I didn't even consider them. They were not even in the running. I clicked on one with a website. I looked at how much it cost. I looked at which package I wanted, and I went in and had it done. And that was it, because they had a website. So most of them have no website. Meanwhile, meanwhile, they're spending hundreds of dollars, can you believe this, on the yellow pages. Nobody uses the yellow pages anymore. The yellow pages is a sinking ship. So they have a budget to get the word out about them. They're just spending it all wrong. So what about designing websites for local businesses? No one is going up to these businesses and saying, hey, you know, I notice you have no website and you're obviously losing traffic to your competitors. How about I design you one? Or what you do is you design one. And by the way, you say, oh, but Woods, I don't know how to design websites. Hold on a minute. But you design one. I would my, one, one way I would consider would be design it on spec and then go in and show it to them and say, by the way, you can have this. And for the first few, you give it away for free. You say, just, just pay me a little hosting charge every month or charge for updates or whatever. But I'll give this thing to you for free for a year. And then it'll be, what, a few hundred bucks, whatever. Make it really, really price competitive. But this way, you build up a few examples for a portfolio. Because you can say, I'll give this away for free just to build up my portfolio. Then when you have a portfolio, you can show people, these are the websites I've done. Then you can start charging. But again, you don't even have to charge that much. You can be very price competitive, and the reason you can be price competitive is, and I'll put in parentheses here, Gary North, whatever else you want to say about him, uh, only an idiot would deny he is a genius when it comes to marketing and entrepreneurship, and he recommends this business model. Now, he recommended a business to me that I've pursued for the past four years that has made me a killing, so I would listen to this guy. He says designing websites for local businesses, this is a great opportunity. You could do it in your spare time. You could make it your full-time work. You're going to have almost no competition because nobody bothers to go to these people and say, here, I'll do it for you. So he says, all you have to do is invest the 500 hours necessary to pick up that skill. All right, well, what if you're a little bit more impatient than that, uh, as my 13-year-old and I are? Is there a quicker way to get to that level of proficiency? And the answer is yes, and it's exactly what Regina and I are going to be doing. This is what we're going to be doing. She's going to, uh, for her, earning $300 on something is almost unimaginably, astonishingly great. But I found a platform we can use that will design beautiful websites that are exactly what a local business needs. They don't need a lot of bells and whistles. They don't. They just need a presence. They need a presence and they need a little bit of SEO. And it's not that hard to provide it to them. So if you're, if you're saying to yourself, I need to do something in the new year, I got to get off my rear end and build up another income stream, well, this is what Regina and I are going to do. And if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if you're interested, we're actually going to be doing a little workshop on how to do it. And you can sign up for that baby over at tomwoods.com slash local for local businesses, obviously, tomwoods.com slash local. And I'm going to just show you what I'm doing. And I think this is much a much better use of my 13-year-old's time than sitting in McDonald's all day, uh, running around like a maniac, uh, flipping burgers. I just I think this is a much, much better use of her time, and it's a better use of the time of a lot of older folks, too. I think it's an easy and obvious business model to pursue. How do you do it? Check it out at tomwoods.com slash local. All right, tomwoods.com slash 814 is where to go for stuff from today, and that is going to do it for us. I'll see you tomorrow. 
Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. This miscarriage, and luckily the, the, his daughter was born, and now uh, he went through a horrible divorce and custody battle, and um, they got joint custody, even though there was all this proof of her um, uh, stabbing him with uh, broken glass faces and um, cutting up his face where he has to wear a beard all the time to cover the scars. I mean, just horrible story. Uh, but, you know, he still has to send off his six-year-old daughter half of the time to the mother's house with her, um, with his daughter's stepfather. And so the, the wife's or ex-wife's new family. And, uh, and even though they have joint custody, he's still having to pay child support and, and be the, you know, financial um, breadwinner and caretaker of the family. Uh, but anyways, I, I say that because I, the story about her, her being pregnant and then when he found out he was going to be deployed, she started trying to induce this, you know, miscarriage or abortion of sorts. And how could you not call that a men's issue when here is a, a father who's for the first time learning that he's going to be a father and wants to protect this child, even though the child, the, the fetus in, is in the woman's body and say it's her body, her choice. But could a man just, you know, helplessly sit there watching as his wife is trying to, you know, kill their baby? Uh, so I, I think that, you know, it, obviously a lot of these issues are very sticky and people have a lot of, uh, you know, opinions that come from, you know, their ideology or morality or religion and all that. But, uh, but you know, I, I think that's just a really heart-wrenching story that uh, in the film, in The Red Pill, there there is a, a leader in, in the feminist movement who says that once a woman is impregnated, it's her choices uh, from then on uh, what happens with the fetus or the child. And uh, he has no say. That's where his reproductive rights end. Uh, so it is an interesting discussion. What about the argument that part of the reason that um, men don't get equal time with children following a divorce is that this is a reflection of the fact that before the divorce, a lot of men are not exactly 50-50 parents. And then after the divorce, suddenly they want everything divided right down the middle. It doesn't work that way. That was the kind of argument I heard in the film. Do, do you – and I know I know the film is not about your personal opinions, but in my conversation with you, I am curious about your personal opinions. What did, what do you think when you hear that kind of argument? Oh, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I really struggled including that uh, soundbite in the film. It was from a, a male feminist scholar. He, he's a gender studies professor at USC, and he said that uh, the Tom Woods Show, episode 814. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here, The Tom Woods Show. To all my young listeners, you want to stand out from your peers, then don't do what they do. Join Praxis, get real on-the-job experience, and a real job. Be entrepreneurial. Get all the details at tomwoods.com slash Praxis. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here, talking today to documentary filmmaker Cassie J whom you can visit at Cassie J, J -A -Y -E com, and her film The Red Pill, which is about the men's rights movement, which she began investigating as what seemed to be an interesting topic for a documentary. But she began it with a distinctly unsympathetic point of view. But by the end of her project, she had come to rethink her assumptions about this and about the position that men hold, for example, in the typical dispute in family court and in a variety of other areas of society, it turns out that the story is not quite as clear as she and many other people no doubt once thought. So the film is The Red Pill. You can find out about it at theredpillmovie.com. And I'm glad to welcome her now. Cassie, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. I watched uh, The Red Pill. Very, very interesting. At, by this point, you're probably tired of telling your story um, of how it is that you went from holding one view to being willing to entertain another view. But at the same time, to me, that's the heart of the whole thing, because it's so rare for somebody to say, you know, people I thought were 180 degrees away from me actually have a point of view after all. So I wonder if you can, before we even get into the details, just comment on that aspect of this. 
I, you know, it's interesting that you say that's so rare and a lot of people do say that's rare. And I think that's kind of sad that uh, not more people are willing to challenge their own strong held beliefs and uh, go to explore the opposing viewpoint to see if they have a point. And, you know, that is what I did with the red pill, although I, I didn't go into making the red pill thinking that was what was going to happen. I, I never imagined that my feminist views would be challenged by uh, going to talk to a bunch of men's rights activists. Uh, but sure enough, they were. And, and the whole film took three and a half years to make. So it was a very long journey of, of me really uh, sitting with the, the, these opposing views and, and really letting them soak in and doing the research to see if they uh, were accurate in what men's rights activists were saying about men's issues. and For 40 years. And then what they were protesting was that he had gotten a divorce back in like 1973. And then he's only been married to his current wife for 27 years. And so they were protesting his divorce from about 40 years ago and I thought all right look you know nobody's perfect and everything but for goodness sake that's what you of, of all the things in the world you're gonna be upset about and they, they didn't even bother to show up as it turns out they were not there but I actually that was the show that I got to meet him afterward and they were all wondering you know we've toured the world as musicians we have never <laughs> encountered a group like this who on earth are these people so so all right I just wanted to raise that because I do think there's an asymmetry let's say in the way different groups greet controversy and opposing views. They might not agree with you, but at least they let you talk. And that's not always the case of the, the, the other way. Now, when in your movie, you do, you do have both sides have their say, and you have some feminist voices in there. And one of the points that one of the people in the film makes is that when you're talking about men and their rights as parents or their right to decide about the, the disposition of a child, the very life of a child, the argument that they made was, Men have, can exercise their rights before they have intercourse, but once impregnation has taken place, one person in your film said it's entirely the woman's choice from that moment on. The men have no input whatsoever, and the argument for that was, after all, it's the woman who bears the burden of childbirth and bears the burden of nine months of pregnancy and the health risks involved, so she really should be the one making all the decisions from that moment on. What would you now, Cassie J, post Red Pill movie, say to that? Is, is there not an at least a superficial plausibility to that argument? Oh my gosh, uh, I I would like to share an email I got today because I think it speaks to uh, this topic. I, I got an email from a gentleman saying, "Thank you for making this film," and he said, "I was raised that you never uh, hit a woman or uh, you know do anything physically." violent to a woman and you also never get a divorce and he entered a, a marriage when he was very young to a woman who was violent and he's in the military and uh, she became pregnant and right after a couple months after she was pregnant they found out she was pregnant he found out he was going to be deployed and she started uh, throwing herself uh, on the ground pounding her abdomen uh, obviously it sounds like this woman has some kind of you know mental uh, disorder issue, uh, but he, you know, was trying to refrain her from, uh, you know, causing. Uh, so it was a very long process. It didn't happen overnight, but the film does uh, show a, a bit of that journey. I bet there are a lot of people listening who don't even know what the men's rights movement is. If you had to summarize it, what would you say it's all about? Oh gosh, uh, well, uh, okay. So the mainstream uh, media version of the men's rights movement is that they're this hate group, they're misogynists, they want to turn back the clock on women's rights. And through my years of making the Red Pill movie, I found out that that was uh, quite a different story once you start talking to men's rights activists. Uh, so really what men's rights activists are about is trying to shine light on the ways that men as a gender are being systematically discriminated against in societies worldwide. And some of the issues that uh, they talk about a lot are definitely father's rights, and there's so many issues under that umbrella um, with uh, child custody and, and uh, joint custody opposition from feminist organizations that, that are fighting joint custody custody legislation. Uh, there's also paternity fraud, which is a man raising child that he later finds out isn't his. Uh, there's alimony. There's uh, the uh, false accusations where uh, people in divorce court, uh, women are uh, kind of have a, um, I guess, more of a free pass to, to make 
allegations against men and be believed. Uh, whereas, you know, it's not often that you'll find a man being able to say, my wife was abusing me, and then therefore he gets uh, custody of the children. So it really is kind of this disproportionate privilege that women have to make these false allegations in order to get uh, custody of their kids or child support. Uh, and then so beyond father's rights, there's also uh, domestic violence issues where if the police are called to a domestic violence situation, the assumption is that the man was the primary aggressor. So he's the one handcuffed and taken to jail, even if he has a stab wound and she has a, a bruise. And uh, beyond domestic violence, we have uh, boys in school, uh, in grade school with uh, this kind of feminized way of, of teaching and learning where you should sit still in your seat and be quiet. Uh, which girls are a lot easier to um, learn that way and be in school that way, whereas boys really need to run around and, uh, you know, touch things, be involved. And then once they go to college, uh, boys have a lower enrollment rate. They're also earning less college degrees. Uh, false accusations on college campuses is an issue. And uh, gosh, there's so many issues, uh, men's health issues, uh, male disposability, which is uh, that majority of war deaths are men, majority of workplace deaths and dangerous jobs are men. Uh, so, yeah, I, I could go on and on, but there's a lot of men's issues. So the men's rights movement is really just trying to shine light on all these various issues. But at the same time, you come out of feminism, you, you come out of uh, you know, at least get influenced by the women's rights movement. And I'm sure you wouldn't say that because you find merit in the men's rights case that there's suddenly no merit to the women's rights movement. So if there are complaints that men have and complaints that women have what the heck's going on here you cannot you know that's that pretty much exhausts it so what's hap how can that be <laughs> yeah well i you know i definitely haven't uh, you know lost compassion for women's issues after making the red pill movie i i all my previous work was really about women's issues and sexuality lgbt issues uh my previous films were largely about women's issues and lgbt issues so you know i have a a lot of uh compassion and, and interest in those topics and exploring those issues. Uh, but with the men's rights movement, uh, they really are just trying to shine a light on something that's rarely discussed. And when it is uh, tried to be discussed in, in uh, on college campuses, uh, in organizing groups, men's rights groups to talk about these issues, they are shut down with protests or pulling fire alarms. And uh, that's, you know, what I saw while I was making the film and also with the release of my film, The Red Pill, we've, we've had a lot of... Um, experiences with censorship and uh, pulling and banning of screenings, uh, even a petition to ban me from the entire country of Australia. Uh, so uh, there's definitely uh, this kind of cultural dialogue that doesn't, uh, when we're talking about gender issues, we really mostly, uh, most people just want to talk about women's rights issues in the gender equality discussion. But if men's rights or men's issues are ever brought up, um, it's called hate speech and it's, there's efforts to shut it down. Let me ask you this. This is somewhat rhetorical, but when you were doing your work on the LGBT documentary, was anybody trying to bar you from entire countries or <laughs> was anybody shouting down uh, um, op opposing views, any conservatives shouting down opposing views when, as far as you could see? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Now, looking back, no, we we didn't have, uh, you know, I wasn't banned from country in the films, wasn't pulled from screenings because it was about uh, LGBT issues. Uh, the, the worst that we had with, with my last film, The Right to Love, which was chronicling a family's fight for gay marriage rights. Uh, the worst we had was, you know, the Westboro Baptist sending some threatening emails, but, you know, that's kind of to be expected. Oh, yeah. No, the, that they don't even count. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they were threatening to protest a uh, an Ian Anderson concert I went to. Now, Ian Anderson's a flute player who's been around.